Welcome back to Monroe Live, everybody. I'm here with Kevin Hardy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we have the Mercedes-Benz EQS, and we're gonna spend some time going through the underbody. So we've actually pulled a couple of the shields off, and it's quite revealing, but Kevin and I are gonna walk through some of the stuff that we found. So the first thing that we noticed was the cradle and the electric drive modules. So Eric, if you can get in here. The cradle is a four-piece cradle. So there's these two large cast nodes on the side, um, on the left and right and there's small extrusions connecting them from the center. Um, this type of execution we've seen Mercedes and, and other OEMs like Land Rover do for the past probably decade. Yep. Um, and the EDM, the electric drive module, is very accessible. Um, oftentimes, the electric motors, in, in order to service them, if there's a problem, you gotta drop the whole cradle, which is more, ex more extensive than actually accessing the bolt, there's two bolts here from the side, um, and then there's two on the back side. And one nice thing about this rear unit is I believe all of the mounts are integrated into the castings. Now, Kevin was gonna talk about this mount right here. And what do you see here? Yeah, so on the side here, this motor, which it says here is a Valio unit, at least a portion they're doing. There's some integration here between the, um, like the intermediate shaft from the EDM coming out. So it's supporting the bearing. You have cooling uh, provisions coming into the motor assembly itself, and then a series of mounting provisions uh, that are supporting both other, other lines here and other parts of like the, the system itself. So it's, it's well integrated and, and, and pretty elegant appearing. Like the, the whole rear in general is, is very elegant. Yeah, um, and in contrast to even Tesla, uh, Tesla will have uh, their their drive unit that they use in the Model 3 and the Model Y, but depending on how it's oriented, mounted in the front and the rear, they'll have a supplemental bracket. So when you have a, a ton of commonality of the core unit, you then have to have ancillary parts to make it match to whether it's the plaid front end or the, or the Model Y or Model 3 front or rear. Um, this is clearly very well purposely built for this vehicle with a huge amount of serviceability. Um, one thing that I don't like about the cradle is we see these extra brackets hanging down. So these are add-on steel stamped brackets with, they even have a little locating pin that's, that's pl plastic, <laughs> a plastic push pin. This is what you'd see on a, a piece of trim, a really nice fastener, and then at the end of the bracket, another fastener. And this is all intended to be a spot to mate for the rear uh, shield. You see similar brackets that are bolted to the uh, this rear tub here, which looks to be like a, a S SMC yeah. fiber composite uh, rear tub. And once again, we at Monroe and Associates, we always try and preach integration. If you're already going through all the work of developing this, in my mind, I'm like, why couldn't they have developed it to be here with the mounting provision right into the tub itself? Yeah. You know, it's just like it's those things that that eat at us and. Kevin, uh, you want to talk about the bracket for the pedestrian warning system over here? Sure, yeah. Like in, in general, when you look at, you kind of come around and take a look, the all-fall, like this is all eventually like a nice flat piece of steel. The amount of all-fall that's present on this, on this bracket is, is substantial. Like the overall utilization of it is, is poor. I understand like the constraints that they, they want to go to, maybe some existing, um, some mounting points here where they're picking up these body points, but it's... It could be better executed and even with these brackets here if you had to have them in steel and you did not want to be in stamping why are they not done in tool draw like an interface where you can maybe have a, a snap provision or something like that where if you need this for compliance or whatever you're trying to achieve whatever constraints you have there it'd be nice to see it in in tool draw get rid of these fasteners and have them like slide into place yeah i do like uh, some dual use so there's these two fasteners on each end of this steel uh i'd say cross car support beam um, they're using these two fastening points um, twice so they're using it to mount the bracket and to secure the beam in so that's at least a, a little more elegant um, but then now we're going to focus back here on the right rear corner this module right here is the onboard charger and right here it says obc gen 4.2 9.6 kilowatts so uh, when you plug your car in at home this is what's going to convert um, the electricity from AC to DC, it's going to handle um, all of that for you. And 
if you look at the wires, we can actually describe what all the wires and hoses are. So right here would be your low voltage connector, which is gonna do all the communication between what's happening. You have your high voltage in, which is gonna go up to your charge port. You have your high voltage out. This will be DC going to the battery and you can actually see it wrap around and head forward in the vehicle to the battery. Then you have these two large wires. This would be your DC supercharging. So uh, typically the DC supercharging will be handled by dedicated lines. These are soft lines. Uh, by soft, I mean they're just normal wires. And we actually grabbed the rigid lines from the Tesla Model S Plaid. Now this outside aluminum, I believe it's aluminum, it might be, I it is. Yeah, yeah, the outside aluminum, this is not conductive. This is actually the outer shield. And inside of there, when we cut through some of the ones on the Model Y, I believe, there's uh, a sheath and then inside the center, there's actually your wire. But um, having a rigid line, you definitely control your uh, dimensions and then there's no mounting provisions. Mm -hmm. They just put this NVH noise, vibration, and harshness sheath on it. Um, so pretty standard and frankly, a little outdated. We've seen the integration of onboard chargers into existing monuments. So when we first tore down um, a Chevy Bolt and our early Model S's and X's, these modules are separate. Um, but lately, it, it makes sense to integrate this into the top of the battery. So if, if you've ever seen the 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 little uh, what do they call the little doghouse yep. on the, fall off the body. yeah underneath your rear seat on a model three or model y you remove that cover uh you'll have your onboard charging unit integrated right next to the battery what that does is that eliminates the need for all of these lines to run from the back of the car all the way to the battery they just run the lines from the charge port straight to the into the battery where they can handle the the conversion and the charging right there um, Kevin, uh, what was another thing? So uh, typically we see these MBH covers. Um, Kevin, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Obviously, like specifically with electric vehicles and in general with Mercedes, we can kind of highlight some place in the bodies. They're, they're plugging off almost every hole in the vehicle. There's a significant layering of like essentially NVH strategies to get this vehicle as quiet as possible. So this is not necessarily uncommon um, given that the the motor is on this side and then a the differential and gear drive unit is on this side of the motor. So it's selective use of how they're trying to, you know, attack the, the MVH strategy itself. And even these mounts that uh, Corey had mentioned earlier, it's a little bit better up front, you can see them, but they appear to be, you know, dual durometer. So there's, there's some effort and time being spent here, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, the structure of this vehicle, I don't think we noticed this. Eric, can you come in here and shoot from inside? Um, if you look up here, you can see an ejector pin location and a little, uh, a little pad saying what the, what the part is. This is a cast piece and it's a large cast piece. It sleeves into another cast piece here and it goes all the way across the car. So the whole rear um, structure piece of the vehicle um, is one large casting and then it is then integrated into an additional large casting, which I do not, it does not go across car. So you see, I think a stamping right here. There's a lot of welding happening. Um, so although it's not the massive giga castings that we see, it is um, at least an attempt to start to utilize larger castings in the body structure. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to tear this vehicle all the way down, but it's something that we really haven't seen so much prevalence, particularly this far back in the rear portion of the car. There is still your standard um, rear bumper, the aluminum crush beam for you know small, smaller impacts. If you got hit in the rear, that would be replaceable. Um, but to have a large casting this far back in the vehicle is something we don't typically see. Yeah, I mean, you know, Mercedes on some of their other vehicles like the E-Class and C-Class, you know, they have cast aluminum shock towers. They do do lightweighting like this with some cast nodes, specifically with the suspension interfaces. It's not uncommon, even with like BMW with the 7 Series and the carbon that's in it. They put a lot of the expensive materials that are hard to replace, typically farther inboard. So this is, this is unique that the casting is this yeah. far out. So, But that's a great point, Kevin, because sometimes steel is the better choice. Yes. So like we showed earlier here, there is two steel tubes, uh, one right next to each other, 
spanning across the vehicle connecting to points of the cradle. This one being underneath the actual isolators and this rod right here, that one is going from one point to the other across the cradle. And the selection of materials on the, the rear lower links, I don't know, can you see this, Eric? You have a, a stamped steel with a hat section. Uh, and this is very similar to what we see on the Model 3 and the Model Y. And then up on top, a welded clamshell. Um, they, you typically will choose a stiffer, welded, stronger clamshell design there because the way the geometry works, it's not straight. You can see it's at a little bit of an angle. As the, as the suspension geometry articulates up, you're gonna wanna shape around you know, your structure up at the top of the body. Um, the aero shield, Kevin, you wanna talk about that? Yeah, so um, and this is kind of like a PET fibrous aero shield. This, this type of material is common in a lot of luxury vehicles in general. So the wheel liners are done this way. Um, it helps with like the tinginess of, of rocks hitting it. Um, there are some like downsides later in life that get clogged with dirt and other things like that. But um, it is a, especially early on in life, an effective NVH countermeasure yeah. uh, for the vehicle. Oh, one last thing on the rear unit, this plate heat exchanger, we thought it was really cute. It's tiny. <laughs> uh, now this is where you're gonna interface uh, the coolant with the gear oil. So half of the flow through this plate stack will be the gear oil that's gonna flow through the gearbox. And the other half is the coolant. And um, they're gonna be dedicating some cooling to the motor itself that's really critical to cool the stator as well as interchange with the gearbox the the one on many of the other oems we see are about two to three times as big as that but maybe they just didn't see you know the need for as much cooling right yeah and now we're going to move to the front of the vehicle you want to now, start from here and then go forward or yeah let's okay. start from the battery leading edge now kevin noticed something interesting about this yeah so i was just, you can see here there's a lot of cross car extrusions and it's it's kind of hard to tell from where we're at but it looks like essentially this cross car member that's going across some torque box the torque box of the vehicle and the rocker structure itself may be separate and you might be able to see eric coming down in here that there's there's a layering of components it's a multi-cell extrusion and it might be a sacrificial nature for this leading edge to help protect the battery one thing that's very apparent is um, there's another separate extrusion. I'll let you kind of pull out so you can see. Here, so this interface was with the cradle itself. I kind of pull this out, and you can see here from the side that it's, that it's a crush can itself. So there's a lot of uh, survivability kind of built into this. Uh, the lower cradle itself is stamped steel. If you actually want to kind of keep that that view that you had before. We kind of talked to you come of some of the things that are here. And you can see, actually, almost what appears, yeah, a Taylor welded blank with this cradle. So it is steel. The lower portion of this cradle is steel. The upper portion that supports the motor itself Kevin, is. Kevin, explain what a Taylor welded yeah, yeah. blank is. So uh, in short, they're tailoring the thickness, which is kind of where the namesake comes from. So this material itself here may be like, you know, three millimeters, two millimeters, whatever it is. And they could be using a, a thinner material here. It helps them tune um, for both weight or potentially impulses and impact um, the performance of this part and it keeps your, your tooling um, down. So instead of having two separate stamp parts with welding operations there, it's you pay a little bit more, more money on the, the, the piece price side, like we talked about the Tesla Model S B pillar, and you got one tool, you throw it in there and it comes out yeah. as one single part. And that Taylor welding happens before the part is ever formed. Correct. So Taylor welded blank, the blank is two thicknesses, so when they smack it, they get desired strength characteristics, you know, before it's all welded together. Um, back to the theme of the right material for the right task. Many of the German OEMs, BMW and Mercedes, we've seen these X braces underneath the cradle. So Kevin, you want to describe, this is actually a pretty small one. I've seen yeah. bigger ones on the BMWs. So it's, it's hard to know for sure without seeing some of their other vehicles, what is necessarily driving the need for this. So um, in general, they're, they're known for the riding, the ride and drive, and just the overall driving dynamics of their, their vehicles, you know, BMW specifically. So this is to help tie in some of those load paths together, going cross car here with the cradle itself and move some things outward um, to help tighten up the vehicle. This may be present on all the EQSs that they have, or may only be present on certain trim levels to get um, 
a desired effect when they maybe yeah. are increasing spring rates or things of that nature. And these so. look like they're there for tension. So these are for when you have a tension load in either direction across the X. They also tie in the front uh, steering rack in as a structural element. Um, so you can see it's bolted directly into the cradle and it ties in there and there. Um, also very serviceable. Um, sometimes it's very hard to service these racks when they are above yeah. the cradle. So I'm noticing a little bit of theme of serviceability. And then the suspension links themselves in the front. So we have a double wishbone virtual ball. So by double wishbone, you can see up top, there's actually an aluminum wishbone. And then the bottom, although it's not a wishbone, you have your uh, tension virtual link, ball. yeah, virtual ball, your tension link, and then your, your lateral link there. Um, this really helps driving dynamics, uh, particularly for tracking and high speed maneuverability. If you can kind of see on this other side, since we're talking about the control arms, Eric, on this side, one thing that's interesting, so this has, this has sensors to, you know, the, to track essentially the movement of the suspension. But from what we can see here, there's no, with that link, so that link is bolting to a, what appears to be a snap in place bracket, and it's not actually fastened to the control arm, which is well, certainly atypical um, with these sensors. Uh, I do notice that those sensors are on all four wheels. Correct. So some uh, OEMs will mount to the left front and the right rear, and that'll allow you to get any roll or any, any variation, but it's not necessarily needed. But they're monitoring on all four, which means they may have, the, their system is, is actually pretty advanced because this is an air suspension system. Um, so it's, it's not, um, not too groundbreaking. <laughs> Um, go ahead. You want to talk about, so we see some high voltage electronics. It looks like this is the inverter for the front motor. And it appears to be integrated, appears to be integrated very closely to the front motor, yep. but not 100%. Um, here's your DC in, you know, from the battery. And so this is your supply from the battery. It's gonna come in here and it'll convert to um, your AC to drive the motor. Although there's an additional line coming out of this. Um, so this could be more than just the inverter. It could be a PDC. So typically we try and look for a label and I'm not seeing a label. Do you see a label? There's a label here, but nothing that essentially is telling us what it might be. Just says EM one one L. Yeah, I think that's a ding level. <laughs> there, there's an additional line right here, of this high voltage line, most likely running to either a high voltage heater, or the uh, AC compressor slash heat pump, yeah. depending on the system. Um, I haven't seen under the frunk. I don't. Oh, there is no frunk. There is no frunk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're gonna maybe later you know, pop the service version of the front, but that could be interesting to look, but kind of to be determined on this high voltage box. I don't want to right. get ahead of ourselves, sure. but there is a NVH mastic pad underneath of it. Look at this. It's a, by mastic pad, I mean, there's a sticky substance right here underneath and then like a, an aluminum layer, um, yeah. most likely for NVH, it's our favorite <laughs> cop out yeah. word. So, and while we're kind of back here, the only thing that kind of disappoints me, and I'm, I'm almost positive it's Mercedes, but they're not to see a non-captive sway bar. So they have a, a bracket here on the top that's captivating the sway bar bushing itself. And there might be a steel sleeve to prevent the ro rotation, or excuse me, the sliding of the, the sway bar back and forth. So it allows you to package everything really tight. And you can see the, you know, that's probably, oh, I don't know, eight to 10 millimeters at most. So I'm a, little, I'm a little upset to see that they didn't use the stamping and essentially omit this part and have the, this bracket, which would be needed, fastened directly to the cradle itself. It's, um, it's either BMW or Mercedes that's done it before. Again, you can see right there, a Taylor welding, but there is something that's pretty cool here that I don't, I don't think I've ever seen before. So there's a, it's a similar strategy. So steel, lower cradle, which makes sense, especially in the front, we saw this on the Mach-E. And then there's a, an aluminum, um, motor slash, you know, PDC, whatever mount up top. So 
this is pretty shiny. We didn't get a magnet on it earlier. We just didn't have the time. So whether this is aluminum, maybe a stainless steel or anything like this, but you can see here it's not welded. And there is a relief here, and these might be bonded in place, which is something I have oh, not seen Oh yeah, before. look at that. There's a little yeah. piece of metal wire. So, or no, that's glue. It's glue. It's it glue. appears to be glue coming out. And you can see it on the front side. Yeah, so both front and rear are done. It's sleeved and glued, yep. not welded. Yeah, it's kind of like a, yeah. a yeah, road get bike. Up, get up close on, you see the glue hanging out of the hole right there. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, you know, on a, on a vehicle in some ways such as this. Uh, you can kind of see also here the dual durometer mounts and they're sitting in a polymer housing as well, which helps with some uh, tunability aspects. And there is one other thing that I've, I've never seen uh, on a cradle here before. I don't know what the best, if you kind of come in and look from this side here, Eric. So, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, Corey. So there is like a, an isolator or a blanket that's going across the top of the steel cradle. Sorry about the dirt and running in between the cradle itself and the body. It goes down, it goes around the CV here, and it runs up front. I've not seen that. I've never seen this before ever. No. So I'd love to know what's driving it. Um, there's a lot of parts, a lot of brackets. There's just a lot of stuff on this vehicle in general, but uh, that's something I've never seen before. Is this a hard mounted cradle? I believe it is. Uh, from the what I can see, front. yes. Uh, um, oh, no, what's that? Oh, well, there's a big composite motor mount right there. I think that's supporting the overall assembly we were just speaking to. Yeah. Well, that's pretty nice. Maybe they're going to win an SPE award for that. <laughs> um, the only thing that's kind of interesting, there's another pedestrian alarm up here in the front, but you can see here there's a band clamp with a coolant line. It's leaking. I don't know how many miles are on this car, but... Oh, is it? How bad is it leaking? Mm -hmm. It's noticeable. I think we would call that, it's not like a class three leak or anything like that, but it is most certainly emanating from that joint. Um, one other core aspect of this vehicle, it is front and rear steer. So there is a whole front uh, uh, steering rack and it's a front steer. By front steer, I mean it's, it's articulating from the front of the, uh, of the pivot. Some vehicles are rear steer. And in the back of the vehicle, when I'm talking about rear steer, they're actually steering the rear wheels with a much smaller um, steering rack. We, we didn't even mention it last time we were back here. So some viewers may be like, hey, what about this? So instead of having fixed link here, there's a smaller range of motion. So if you look at these bellows, it's not as big as you would need um, to steer the front of the vehicle. Because when you're steering the front of the vehicle, you need a huge amount of, it's a, it's, I mean, a decent amount of articulation. Mm -hmm. The rear suspension is not set up for that, but for driving around a corner to turn a little bit in the opposite direction is a huge advantage. I would not say this is intended to do crab walking or anything, but no. we see this for performance, particularly for high speed, medium speed cornering. Um, pretty cool. Um, I'm excited to drive this vehicle. Um, I'm gonna take it home over the weekend. So thanks to Mercedes for, for, for giving this to us. If you didn't notice, it's an M plate. So I don't know if it came straight from them or or whatnot. Um, I think this wraps up the quick underbody review of the EQ EQS. A few housekeeping things. Thank you to all of the bumper sticker supporters for the Model S Plaid. I know that sometimes we see in the comments like, hey, what about us? Um, we really appreciate the support to help us purchase that vehicle. And really good news, uh, we wired all the money for our second Rivian. It's currently in California. We bought it uh, from a, a private individual that is being shipped here and should be here anywhere from five to eight days. So in the coming weeks, we're gonna start uh, a, a robust array of real world driving uh, tests, off-road driving tests, towing tests, and then a full teardown to bring to all of our viewers. So thanks again to Mercedes for lending us this vehicle and let us uh, review it. Anything, any final words, Kevin? No, I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of interesting things as well. So uh, that's all. All right. Excited for the Rivian. So thanks again. Bye. All right. One additional <laughs> thing. I don't know when this will be weaved into the video. Uh, Two-piece rotor. So we noticed that the hat section uh, appears to be kind of a deep drawn stamping. So if you've ever looked at a transmission housing that would, a transmission 
piece that would hold clutch plates. Like that's the pattern that you would typically see the clutch plates in. And they're using, I believe it's a stamped steel center section. Mm -hmm. Then you have your cast rotor on the outside. Now, there's many reasons you want to do this, particularly for heat dissipation, expansion. It allows a little bit of float on the cross car direction, uh, particularly for all of uh, the vibration and thermal expansion. So Kevin, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the material is. Again, the magnet, see what it did, um, to see what it might actually be. If it's steel or if it's aluminum, you know, we've seen again on BMWs and some on, on some of the Mercedes as well, you know, hybrid rotors where they're doing a stamp center section and they rivet the steel brake rotor on to save weight. There's, a, there's actually a substantial amount of weight to be saved there. Uh, something as exotic as like a, like a floating pin rotor where they, they have steel pins between the rotor and a, an aluminum hat section on some of your higher end performance cars. But uh, again, it's money uh, spent and uh, to help improve the performance of the vehicles because I don't know that off the top of my head the weight of this, but it's in heavy. general, EVs are not light, so. Yeah. All right, well, that's just a little extra tidbit there.